First, I want to thank God because He's been good to me, He's been good to my family. And I thank God because I had the opportunity to preach again. And I just, you know, I get really excited when I'm here. Also, nervous, but excited. Um, I also want to, I want to say this uh, th thank Brother Richard here for last Sunday that he helped me out because um, Pastor Villas was having trouble with the control. So I asked him if he can help me out, and he said, Yeah, I'll go get it. Thank Brother you here. I mean, he's always up here now. There with the he's always fixing the mics, cleaning the mics. So I mean, God bless Brother you here. So, um, so Micah chapter seven verse eight says, "Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light to me." Can, can you guys put the mic a little bit down? Thank you. I mean, so, I want to preach you guys today on the title, Don't Rejoice, My Enemy. So, um, let's bow down and, and, and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, Lord, to praise you, to worship you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for giving me the opportunity to be here once again, Lord, to be in your house and again, Lord. I ask, Lord, this morning that you bless us, that you send your spirit over us, Lord, that you feel the atmosphere of the presence, Lord, that when we feel your glory once again this morning, Lord, I ask that you preach to us, to our hearts, and to our minds, Lord, that everybody that is here, Lord, that can hear this word with freedom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, um, the first, uh, the, so I, the title is, um, I'm going to rejoice my enemy. And as, as Christians, as uh, when we get baptized, Jesus takes it. When we get baptized and we become Christians, uh, we enter this war that we're always in a constant war and we're always being attacked by an enemy. And we all, you know, we have you know, the same enemy and we have enemy, which is Satan, and we got ourselves and the flesh. So we're always constant war with those three. And we're always uh, being attacked constantly. And, they're always, and then we have an enemy that's always trying to defeat us, and he'll use any tactics or any weapons so he can bring us down. And there's a, a tactic or a weapon that's been used since ancient times, you know, by the ancient Romans, any war in the ancient times that's been used to fight wars. And it's been used since the beginning, and that weapon is a weapon of fear. But when we think of weapons uh, fighting in the war, the first thing that comes to our mind is military, right? Military hardware, we think of guns, tanks. We, th we think of aircraft, jets, missiles, submarines in the, in the sea and satellites. That's the first thing that comes to our mind when we think that the war is going on. That's the first thing, first thing that we think that's going to happen. The first thing that the enemy is going to use, right? But arguably, arguably, the most effective, the most dangerous, and the most secret weapon are those that, are not, that, can't, that can't be seen. And fear is one of them. See, there's this military officers, and he wrote this and said, this is what fear does. So it says, fear can be produced deliberately through a number of techniques. Creating fear is part of the little known or within military and strategic studies called psychological warfare. Psychological warfare is an unusual form of warfare as it does not physically attack the target group, the enemy, in order to destroy them, but the minds of the target group. See, so a lot of times we, when we get attacked, we don't get attacked physically by the enemy. If we get attacked in our minds, and when it comes to our minds, one of the weapons that he uses is fear, because fear brings doubt. And when fear brings doubt, you start doubting about yourself. You start doubting about God. I was thinking about this the other day that when, when I'm scared of heights, and if they ask me to jump three feet from here to there, I'll do it. But if I'm in a hundred-story building to jump to another one, I'll start doubting. I'll start doubting about myself if I'm capable of doing of jumping three feet. So that's what the enemy wants. He wants to 
a tie in our minds and put fear in our hearts. And, and this weapon is still being used by military personnel and by, by, by Satan himself. So there's a story in the book of uh, 2 Kings, chapter 18, verse 17. And um, if you guys can open your Bibles, because we're going to be doing a little bit of reading. It's a little bit, a little bit of verses that I want to read, but I want to get a point across. So it's uh, 2 Kings, chapter 18, verse 17. And we're going we're gonna to start from there, so. So it says, verse 17, The king of Assyria sent this, his supreme commander, his chief officer, and his field commander with a large army from Lachis to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They came up to Jerusalem and stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. They called for the king and the Yakim son of Kilkai, the palace administrator of Shidna and the secretary and Joah, son of Asad, the recorder, went out to them. So, they, so the, the, the personnel from King Hezekiah went to meet the, the commanders from Assyria. So verse 19 says, The field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, This is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have the consul and the mind for war, but you speak only empty words. Um, who are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you're depending on Egypt, the spitter reed of staff, which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. So we're going to jump to verse 26. Then Elikim, son of Hikaya, and Shema, and Joah said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand that don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. So they were telling them, don't speak to us in Hebrew because everybody's listening to you guys. Don't speak to us in Hebrew because we don't want the people on the other side of the wall being afraid of what's going to come in this war. But verse 17, this is, what, this is what the commander from Assyria responds. But the commander replied, said, Was it only to your master and, and you that, that sent me to say these things, and not to the people sitting on the wall, who like you will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine? So verse 32, Until I come and take you to the land like your own, and land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of all of the trees and honey, Choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the gods of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sherebain, Hena, and Iba? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of this country have been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded not to answer him. So, and I was a little bit reading, but so the king of Assyria sent his people and told and to tell King Hezekiah from Jerusalem and tell not only him but everybody on the other side of the wall in Jerusalem what was going to happen. So they were trying to put fear in their hearts so they could start panicking. And then start doubting about their God, and then he starts talking about God. You see all these nations that have over uh, destroyed their God's going to save them. What's gonna, what? That's the same thing that's going to happen to you guys. Your God's not going to save you. So they were trying to put fear in their hearts, right? But then the king told his, his people, "Just listen to them, but do not answer them back." See, I want, I want you, I want you guys to understand something. We don't need to answer our enemy. We don't need to explain to him who's going to save us. We don't need to explain to him what is our game plan. We don't need to explain how we're going to come up with this situation. Because what the enemy wants us to do is 
get in this conversation with him and talk about what's going to happen and who's going to save us because he wants us to waste our time arguing with him instead of using our time praising God. See, the enemy wants us to get into this conversation and keep talking back and forth and getting into it with it because he wants us to take the time that belongs to God. Take the time that belongs to worship God. He wants to take the time and, and, and put the time into focusing on our problem. That's what the strategy of the enemy is. He's trying to waste the time and take the time that belongs to praise God. But I'm telling you right now that I'm not going to let the problem that I'm going through or the situation stop me from praising God. I'm not going to let the sickness take the time that belongs to my God. No, I refuse to let that situation take over my heart and take over my, my mind and take over and just think about that day and night instead of thinking of, 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 of my God. Because the truth is that a lot of times we think more of our, our problem than when we think of our, our God. And that's what the enemy wants. To take the focus away from God and focus it on our problems. And that's, that was, that's what's going on here. They were trying to take time away from King Hezekiah and just have him out there talking and saying, who's going to save you? And then the one that answered to Hezekiah to answer, the guy was going to say, because King Hezekiah said, I'm not going to answer anybody. I'm not going to answer nobody. At verse 9, chapter 19, this is what, this is what King Hezekiah did. Chapter 19, verse 1 says, When King Hezekiah heard all this, he tore his clothes and put on a sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. See, they, they were asking him, How are you going to overcome us? How are you going to defeat us? You say you have a great army, but we don't see anything. We don't see any. And then they even mocked him and said, We'll give you 20,000 horses if you can even put riders on. So they're telling you don't have any, any, anybody to fight for you. How are you going to save us? But King Hezekiah said, I don't need to tell you who's going to fight for me. I don't need to tell you what's going to happen because I don't fight my battles. I go to the one that fights for me. See, I, I, I don't have a plan. I don't have a strategic plan because I don't fight my battles. No, that's, that's, that's what we should do when we get our, our problems. We better ask, I don't have a game plan. I don't have a strategy because I'm not the one that fights my battles. I'm not the one doing the fighting. God is. So we don't have to waste time looking out or figuring out how we're going to fight or how we're going to overcome things because we're not the ones doing the fighting. God is. So instead of wasting our time getting back and forth with the enemy, what we need to do is focus our time in praising and worshiping God because he's the one that's going to solve our problems. See, but the enemy is going to try to put fear in us. And when, we, and when we start getting fear, and we start getting down, and that's when we start losing patience. And that's when we start losing the fight because we want to fight the fight by ourselves. We want to do things by ourselves. See, when we start focusing on a situation, that's when we start losing the battle because that's what the enemy wants, to fight by ourselves. He wants to isolate us. He wants to make us fight the battle by our own because he knows that we can't point on ourselves. But King Hezekiah said, no, I'm not going to fight here. I'm not going to answer here. I'm going to go to the one that fights for me. He has the game plan. He, has, he knows what he's going to do. He knows how we're going to overcome this. I don't need to fight. That's what the enemy wants, to isolate us. And this is what happened in, in, in Jude chapter 1, verse 8, or no, just verse 8. When the archangel Michael was, it says, but when the archangel Michael, when he was speaking with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself there to condemn him for a sign that was said, the Lord rebuke you. So they were going back and forth with, you know, Mark, um, Michael with, with the devil. And, he's, and she said, you know what, I'm not going to get into this with you. You know, the Lord rebuked you, said, 
I don't have time to be fighting, going back and forward. I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to do this right here. My Lord, my God is going to do this. He's going to fight. So in the name of Jesus. So that's what the enemy wants. He wants us to waste time. See, that one's going to come against us with fear, with sickness, with tribulation. But we're going to stand like David said, you come to me with all those things, but I come to you in the name of Jesus. I come to you in the name of the Lord. Because that, the Lord is the one that gives us the victory. Though the Bible says that he has made us more than overcomers. Not just overcomers, more than overcomers. Because when, you, when uh, there's a war, a military war, you know, people fight. And when they win the fight, they usually say, well, we won, but at what cost? Sometimes they lose more than they won. But with God, we don't lose anything. Because he says that he has made us more than overcomers. So when we fight our battle, what we lost, we just look at the back. Doubles it sometimes. Because we get more than what we fought. So when we fight our battle, there's a victory. And when we just don't get the victory, we get a blessing with that. So instead of wasting time and energy on fighting the enemy, spend your time worshiping God. See, Job was going through this situation, and we all know the story of that. That the enemy kept bringing problems to, to his life that, you know, once everyone was talking, you know, before he was finished, you know, then another came and told his sons were dead, and then before he was finished talking, then told that his, you know, all his camels were destroyed and killed, and so it, things were coming after and after, one after another. All his wealth was gone, you know, he took all his children, and eventually he took his health. And it also says that the devil was going back and forth, you know, he would go to God, and then he would go to Job and look what was the situation, and, and God would keep telling him, look, see, he still, he hasn't refused, he's still, he's still a loyal servant. But every time the enemy would bring something, I can imagine rejoicing and waiting for Job to say those words, you know what, I give up, and, you know, he was waiting for Job to, to curse God. And he kept going back and forward, waiting for those words, right? But Job never said that. When Job opened his mouth, he opened his mouth to praise God. He said, the Lord gives and takes away. Blessed be his name. So stop saying your situation is unfair. Stop believing your situation is unfair. And start praising God. Because it's easier to complain than to be thankful. Because we can be complaining that we lost many things this year, that we lost our jobs, that we lost our cars with this pandemic. It's easier to complain that. But instead of complaining, we should be thankful that we still have our lives, that we're still alive. See, it's easier to complain than to be thankful for all the things that God has done for us. And about Five years ago, uh, my family went through, a, through the toughest time uh, that, we, that we've been through. Uh, uh, I remember uh, 2009, my grandpa had a, a how do you say that, my brother, you know? uh, How do you say the how do you say that in English? Oh, straight, yeah, he had a stroke. The doctors told him that he was going to stay like that for forever, and you know, he was lucky to be alive because he, uh, his, his, his uh, understanding would come and go. Sometimes he would recognize my dad, sometimes he would recognize my dad, but he couldn't really walk. So, in other words, he was like a vegetable, but he could understand some things. So, he was like that for, for five years, five, six years, like that. And my aunt and my dad were praying and fasting for him to, to get healed. But then one, uh, I remember one Monday morning on January 7th, I gave a call that he passed away. And you know, it was really hard for us as he, he was like my dad because I lived with him for like three, four years when I was growing up. He was the one taking care of us because my dad was, you know, he was here. But he, uh, he passed away, and my dad was, 
was really sad and he felt that God didn't answer his prayers and he was going through a tough time and my pastor remembers like this pastor who had to go to he went to our house to try to talk to him and, and encourage him and then he said pastor you know what I'm going to have you coming here on Wednesday to the Bible study to tell you guys so um, but my dad was going through a tough time you know thinking that God you know, didn't hear the prayers or my dad felt like he he felt that he didn't pray enough or he didn't fast enough. So he was going through a tough time. And then about a year later, my brother passes away. He gets into a motorcycle accident. And he, he passes away. So my dad, again, he he gets in, you know, in this situation that he feels really sad again. You know. He starts doubting. You know. I remember one night he called me. You know, just during the, the week that he, you know he passed away, God, he he calls me and he tells me, "Look, God, I, I need you to help me." I mean, I'm talking with with what? He's like, "I need you to help me pray for your brothers and sisters because none of them are in church." Because at that time it was just me and my parents that were going to church, and you guys know I have a big family. You know, I have five brothers and three sisters, so none of them were going to church, so. My, uh, my dad said, I need you to help me pray for him. I need you to help me pass with him because you're not in church. You know, your brother just passed away. And he wasn't in church, so he said the mercy of God now. Wow. So I remember I, I told him, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll help you. I'll pray. I'll help you pass with him because, you know, we, we, um, we don't know things that come from one day to another. So I remember I went to sleep that night. And I don't know if it was a dream or a vision, but when I was I was sleeping, you know, I have I get a call again, you know, in my, in my dream, and it's my dad, and he's pretty much telling me the same thing again to help me pray, but this time it was different. He sounded a little bit different, and he was telling me that he couldn't do it no more. You know, in my dream, he was telling me that he couldn't do it no more. He, he didn't know if he was going to continue on this walk because it was too hard. But at that, at, that, at that moment we started speaking those words, I saw the more he would speak negative, the more he would speak about doubting, I, I saw his sounds. And I saw a lot of you know, demons gathering outside the house. The more he was speaking of that, the more they were gathering. And and I was saying, no, you know, it's something that don't, you know, you don't, don't say that. Just, you know, we're gonna continue. I'm gonna help pray. But he kept saying, you know, it was it was being hard for him. And he's like, you know what? That's it. I, I don't I don't want to continue anymore. I quit. I refused to God. And I remember that as soon as he said that, all the demons, and it was this a hundred demons, went to his house and destroyed everything like that. That as soon as he says his words, I quit. I give up. No. They enter the house and destroy everything. So I wake up and I start and I start uh, start praying. And I started praying and said, you know. Calling on the name of Jesus, you know, in Jesus' name. And I started saying, I started saying, you know, don't rejoice over my enemy, don't rejoice over my family, because you will not see a victory here.
So, many years later, my, my brothers and sisters, they're in church. Perhaps when we call on the name of Jesus, when we call on his name, we get an answer. Because the Bible says that the, the prayer of the righteous has power. Yeah. So, I'm going to ask you guys to stand up. And I don't know if you guys are going through any situation or any tough moments that you feel like you're going down. That you feel like there's no, there's no hope. That you feel like the enemy is winning the battle. I want you guys to declare that and say, I'm going to rejoice on my enemy because you will not see a victory. Yeah. 